Welcome everybody to your Badass Journey podcast. Today I have James Patrick with me and I'm so excited to introduce him to you. He is one of the most brilliant creative minds I have gotten to know uh, as of lately and also has so much to share with you that I can't wait to just jump into this conversation. Welcome, James. Kareen, how are you doing? <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so great to to have this time with you. I mean, these are like my coveted conversations that I get to share with others, but I I really love to kick things off where you get to share how your bad, badass journey has gotten you to where you are today. So you can start as far back as you'd like in kind of sharing with our listeners more about you and what it took to get you to this point of running multiple businesses and um, staying creative in that space. Sure, absolutely. So feel free to jump in, cut me off at any point because otherwise I may just keep going. Okay. <laughs> so I, I would say... The badass journey for me probably started. It, it started getting some some roots going probably when I was in college, and that's when I first came across photography. I was working as a journalist while I was going to school for a degree in journalism. I wouldn't argue that I was a great journalist. In fact, I'd probably argue the exact opposite. I was I was a fair to midland at best journalist. And I mean, that was just, I mean, that was indicative based upon the fact that I was very bored going out to do assignments. And one night I'm working late on an assignment. My editor comes up to me and says, James, I need you to go cover this new piece. It just came in. Uh, it's right now. And so I'm running out the door with my little reporter notepad ready to go cover this piece. And my editor stops me and said, actually, we're out of photographers. I need you to take photos to go along with this article. And I said, yep, sure, whatever. And it was, and I said it without really thinking much about it. He hands me a camera. And as I'm rushing out there, he says, well, do you know how to use it? I'm like, on. Then that, that, was, that was my answer. And the photos were, you know, uh, illustrated how poorly I was at taking photos. Uh, but it was, it was interesting enough to want to explore it further and explore it further. I did. I got uh, significantly more into photography, but I did it very backwards in the sense of I didn't go through the process of, you know, uh, developing a portfolio, then getting an internship with another photographer and starting to work on small editorial projects at first and work my way up to commercial projects. Right off the bat, I started shooting commercial projects for money. And it was something where I didn't know that was that I should not have done that. And not that it was bad or wrong. It was just, I just did it because I'm like, oh, well, my friend owns this clothing store in town. I want to shoot those ads and I want to be the person to do it. And I didn't I didn't know that there was supposed to be, you know, a protocol that you're supposed to follow with it. So I started doing that. And then at some point realized, oh, I should actually go back to learn how to take better photos. So then I went back to actually do the process of interning with another photographer and developing that. Um, Post-college worked in marketing for better course of a decade while still managing my, my side job as a photographer. And at some point, I just had to make that leap. I had to make that transition where I was... Because I was working two full-time jobs at this point. I, I, I put in my 40 hours of work at my marketing job. And then every evening, every weekend, every time I had eight hours of sick time, vacation time, I was cashing it out and immediately pouring it into this other business. And I took the leap. I took the jump, left the full-time career, left the 401k, left the benefits, left the steady paycheck, all of it, and was... Was trying to become an artist, which you know, I think back to my, you know, when I first thought about photography as you know, much younger, when my father just saying, "Well, it's a very expensive hobby." So flash forward, and now I'm just like, I'm doing it and doing it during one of the worst recessions our country's ever seen. That's about the time when I made that transition. So figured it out through probably through a lot of failure to figure out the right things. Grew that business, and it was that business then that inspired me. Thankfully, for a lot of the background I had in journalism and marketing, to then launch some auxiliary businesses, some side businesses, and some things that really rounded out my my portfolio as a business owner. I think it's uh, an amazing journey when you can realize, hey, there's something that I am interested in. I'm not quite good at yet, you know, at the beginning, and then realize you had to 
kind of step backwards to learn a different way to kind of align with your passion. I think that's that's really cool just at the start what you shared there. And then to take it and really build a business out of it. What what was it that came out of, you know, the marketing years when you were doing that and you had the side hustle of photography that kind of made you trigger, you know, now's the time to go out on my own. Like what were what was going on then? I want to say that I was actually very resistant to becoming a full-time photographer for a long time. I was resistant in college to even really get into photography, even though it interested me. It was too risky of a career. Mm. Okay. Like once again, to think back to what my father said, this is an expensive hobby. Hobby does not indicate this is has any potential to have a career. Yep. And I was just following the career trajectory that I had laid out for myself, which was the safe career trajectory. I went to the safe college. I was following the safe career path, doing what I had done the day before, which was I've been writing as long as I can remember. I'll just keep writing. And I, and I had a certain college professor who maybe he hated my writing or maybe he loved my photos. We're not sure. Mm-hmm. Who demanded that I push photography a lot more. Mm. So he he managed a newspaper. And after interning at this newspaper, he said, okay, you are now a photographer at this newspaper. Okay. You're now a photo editor at this newspaper. By the way, there's now a photo editor job at a magazine that just started up. I need you to apply for that. And it was doing that, which kind of made me realize that, oh, okay, this is something I could actually do as a side business. Right. Once again, not fully seeing that this could be a real thing. And I marketing was a safe lateral move from working in journalism. It's still communicating. It's still storytelling. It's still all the principles that I would learn as a writer, as a journalist, but in a different context. So that was a smooth transition into marketing, worked in marketing. And I'm so glad I had that job because I learned a tremendous amount about proactive work, about lead tracking, about client relationships, about managing clients, about managing accounts and managing projects working in a team setting uh, about how to lose and how to lose gracefully. Uh, Learned a lot of these lessons, which I was then able to apply to my photography business. But at some point, I just felt that calling like, this is something I can't not do. And, And I very specifically remember what my boss told me when I turned, when I finally turned in my notice, it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And I, I very, I was like sh- almost shaking. I was so scared to do this. I'm like, I can't believe this is actually going to happen. What if this doesn't work? What if, you know? And all the all the worst case scenarios go through my mind. And then I I kind of sat back and realized, well, if this doesn't work, I'll just get another job in marketing. Yeah. Like I'm doing really good at this job in marketing. I, I'm competent at it. I'm being approached by other companies to leave my current company to go do the same work for them. So there are opportunities in this field. Should this should this dream not pan out how I wanted it to? And you know, so I tell my boss, okay, I'd like to get my notice. And he sits back in his chair and he takes a deep breath and he kind of smiles at me and he says, I'm surprised it took you this long. Yeah. That's a great encouragement, you know, to say that they saw your talent as well. To yep, that's that's where you belong. I I've gone I've gone through phases like of that myself. And what I when the first time I had to jump big and let go of full time to pursue, you know, certain life goals, I told myself I could always be where I am today. Similar to where you're saying to yourself, I could always get another marketing gig. Mm-hmm. Like I have, I have a little bit of mastery in this area, and if not, I can at least find something to pay the bills. You know, if X Y Z that I really want didn't work out, and it would give me that same sense of empowerment to say. I have faith in my skill set, but now it's time to stretch myself and go towards what it is that I really am passionate about, that I really want and step into it. And and also doing it as a side hustle for a while is important too when you're trying to test out a new skill set. So how was it when you actually were working full time and managing this side hustle, <laughs> you know, from a time management standpoint? Did you find a good integration there? Or did you feel like it was competing with each other? And that also helped with making the decision to go all in? Uh, well, you know, it's it's funny because because some might say that I I was forcing myself from one to the other. Almost, almost in the sense of, I remember one of my coworkers. Uh, their their 
report to me on one of my annual reviews was you've become very aggressive and abrasive in your marketing job. I'm like, yeah, that's probably true. That, that's probably very true. I did not manage balance. There, there, I, I should say there was no balance. It was, it was a, it was a zero balance. It was, it was everything or nothing for me because right. on top of that, I had this opinion that in order for this to work, I had to, and I was following these, these six words and I still follow these six words only. I follow them now with balance, but it's six words, three things, be seen, be heard, be read. Mm. And I was doing this, but doing it within two different careers. I was doing this with James Patrick, the marketing professional, but I was also doing it with James Patrick, the photographer. So there was a time during this while working these two full-time jobs that I was on seven boards of professional trade organizations, seven. I was president of several of them. I want to say I was president of three of them on the board of the other four, meaning monthly meetings, board meetings, uh, you know, all, all the ancillary work that comes with being on a professional organization. Sure. But this was part of being seen, being heard, being read. Mm -hmm. And I was also doing public speaking at the time, speaking on behalf of the company, speaking on marketing. I was, I was back into writing because I was writing marketing-based articles, uh, marketing research papers, white papers about the work I was doing. So PC, be heard, be read. But then I was also trying to do this with my photography career simultaneously and uh, I, uh, and and I remember uh, my doctor at the time said, you know, uh, I, I've never seen someone really struggle with stress this much. Like you are really not managing your stress levels pretty uh, well at all. And I said, okay, maybe I should do something just a little different here. Yeah, a, a great lesson and and awesome that you took action because now you're running Fitposium. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you to tell our listeners about that journey of how Fitposium started and and you know what that's all about. One of the things that I always find so fascinating is the idea that when we walk down a path and we're doing something, all these doors will kind of pop up along the path. I was walking down the path of being a writer when a door opened to become a photographer. And I stepped through that door. While on that path, a door opened to get into marketing. So I walked into that. A door opened for public speaking. And I keep going through these doors that open up as I'm walking down a path to explore and see what would happen if or what would this be like. And I'm curious about this. I think curiosity is something that that successful entrepreneurs have to have. It, is, it must be ingrained in their DNA. They must be curious. What would happen if? And... In the context of now that I'm working as a full-time photographer, I'm building a business. I have, I, I've, I've niched myself. I have a very specific clientele. And what I was working with, I was working with professional athletes, up-and-coming amateur athletes, and, and health and fitness professionals. So it was within this, this brand of sports, fitness, wellness. And I'm working with all these clients, building brand collateral for them. Because because a photograph, this, this is brand collateral. This is something that they're using to market themselves with. This is something they're using to put in front of media agents. It's something they're looking to get sponsorship deals with. And I'm creating imagery that I'm very proud of. But then I'm seeing my clients struggle in the application of the imagery. And I'm looking back and now I'm pulling my experience in marketing, which thankfully now I have my experience in journalism as a storyteller. And I'm looking, I'm like, well, you're just telling your story incorrectly. You're not telling your story with enough resonance. You're not telling your story with enough impact. You're not getting, your message is not getting heard. It's not getting seen. So it doesn't matter how good these photos are. If no one sees these photos, you did not achieve your goal. So I said, well, let me start blogging about this. Once again, be seen, be heard, be read. Let me start blogging about this. So I started blogging about the marketing of your imagery, the application of your imagery, how to properly brand yourself as a freelancer, as an entrepreneur in the health, fitness, sports, wellness space. The blogging turned into podcasting a few years later. And I was kind of turning this and then I would turn that into eBooks for a while. And then I started doing public speaking, speaking at different conferences for health and fitness professionals, personal trainers, uh, fitness talents, speaking about the marketing of their brands. But the one thing that was missing out of all, because I hadn't really monetized any of that. This was just sharing information. There was no monetization behind it. The one thing that kind of shifted it was my desire to form a community around it. I said, if I'm providing this information or finding others, you know, whether it's through interviews or what have you, 
if we're providing all this great information, inspiration for people to excel in their careers, why don't we provide a, a, a platform where they can come together and be a community and go somewhere together as a community, as a tribe, as a family to learn, to share best practices and to see how far they could go. That was the birth of the conference symposium. It was, let's bring people together, let's share these insights, and let's see how far people can level up. I think it's brilliant to figure out a forum where um, monetization can happen in the connection, you know, like in the environment. And it's not just about your own personal monetization because you yourself run a team. Like you have more than just you as the, the Pied Piper of your business, right? And all that you do. Uh, along with your photography, but to to display like here are all these other amazing people to work with as well, and this is how when you leverage the community, you can grow together, which is really cool in in the uh, Fitposium space, and that also translates in the book that you wrote and launched as well, like the actual tips and tools and how to build your business and market and you know just get past obstacles. Uh, so. Leveraging that information is do you do you apply that into your Fitposium conference as well from your oh absolutely and it, one of one of my favorite things about the conference I guess there are a few one is when we're prepping the conference as as I'm prepping now our fifth one which will be in October of 2019 when we hand select the different presenters and the topics they are going to present at and I'm able to look at from a bird's eye view to see. Oh my God, if I'm attending this conference and I go to this session here and this session here and this session here, like these are, this is what I would want to learn if, if I were in that. I mean, even in myself as a photographer, I could sit there in the back of these rooms and take notes. And I've done that, you know, with, with some of our presenters and I'll leave with like notes and, and I hear it from, from, you know, contractors where maybe it's photographers or video teams or, you know, people work in the back of the room. And, and then, you know, we'll kind of debrief at the end. They said, okay, how did all the sessions go? Like, oh my God, I took so many notes. I'm like, oh, my own team is taking notes. This is brilliant. I love that. Yeah. Uh, To see that sort of value. I love seeing that. That that's one of my favorite things to work on, on the conference. And the other thing I like to see is I like to see when people apply it, because what is the point of going to a conference, getting all this information to not do anything with it? Yes. Or... Or the person who is the forever student, like, you know, sitting, you you can't see on the video, but like what I'm facing is I'm facing two big bookshelves filled with, I don't know, 500 different marketing books. Right. And I've read the lion's share of them. What is the point of buying these books, reading these books, if I'm not going to then take action and start to apply these lessons? So I love, love to see when our attendees start to take action, start to do things, and you start to see them get that momentum. and. One of the coolest things is a lot of our presenters every year at this conference are people who've attended the conference before. Oh, that's beautiful. On their business, and now they can teach everything that they learned. Oh, what a great evolution and opportunity that you're you're giving your community. Because I, I agree, there's so much learning that is occurring out there, and we're inundated with so much information today that it can always create like analysis paralysis on like what action do you take next and the fact that you're bringing together an amazing team of um, coaches trainers and um, just thought leaders in their space and um, showing them how you know giving them practical knowledge to jump into action and then as a community support each other I mean I think that's so important you know for anybody who has a stage, to make sure that they're cultivating that for their um, their community, and it's so great that you do it in such a creative way. Well, one of the things that that I separate is the difference between simple and easy, because it has never been simpler to do anything. And the reason it's never been simpler is precisely what you just said. There's never been more information. I mean, information at scale is free. So the information like you pay to go to a conference like the Posium or you pay to be a part of a mastermind or you buy a book that's sitting on your shelf, you can find the same or, or a facsimile of that information for free, I promise you. So information at scale is free. It's never been simpler to find it. And it's never been simpler to do things like set up a website, like set up a, a payment uh, gateway, like set up a, a system to communicate with others through email, through social media. Because all these things have been built, all the roads have been paved, all that work is done. Okay, so it is very simple 
to build a business. It is very simple to make that business appeal to others. And it's very simple to invite others into that journey. However, the it is not easy because then comes the hard work, the hard work of making it relevant, the hard work of getting their attention, the hard work of earning their attention, and then the hard work of bringing them in to be a part of that community. That is not easy. That is very hard work. It takes lots of time, takes lots of focus, takes lots of energy and attention, but it's never been simpler to right. do it. Right. Yeah. The, and it's, it's really about the consistency and the action plan that you put together um, to keep that ideal client in mind. You know, to make sure that you're not also making it over complex so that the invitation isn't understood, right? The Mm -hmm. invitation to come into my world and and purchase something from me, right? Like as a as a business owner. Um, and I think it's important to also check in to say, Am I making it more complex? Even though it's it's it can be it's simpler these days. There's also all this layering and and again that information inundation on the how to. It's like you have to also find what's the best fit for you as an individual and your skill set and who do you need around you to fill in the gaps. You know, mm-hmm. so, sometimes too when we go from um, full time work for working for someone else and then maybe move into let's say contracting gigs to to feel what it feels like to be self employed. You know, as that that next level and then maybe moving into next of I actually now want to build a full on business. There's growth spurts that need to occur too in how you create the right systems and operations and and level of service really so that when you are inviting someone in, they are getting everything from end to end from you and things don't fall off. And that is the... Um, not so easy part. Uh, it's it's you know it, it has its own complexity, but I think with practice, understanding, and mentorship, and coaching, and and just connection, right? You can you can build that up as well. And I think so much of it is understanding what you are really here to do. Yeah. Okay. Versus like within the context of what I work on or what my team works on, it really falls into a very simple barometer. And anytime we're faced with an opportunity, we have to contrast it against this barometer. And the barometer is this, and this is this is for our company, is we create art and opportunity for others. So art to me is that's my photo work, that's my podcasting, that's my writing, that's 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 the the information that I could share with people. That's storytelling. That's when I get up on stage and and I and I give a discussion. Okay, that is creating art. The other is creating opportunity. It's what you do with the art. So the opportunity to take it, to leverage it, to build it, to market it, to grow with it. So anything that we're faced with, we have to contrast against that. Is this creating art or is this creating opportunity for others? And if the answer is no, we know that is not where our focus needs to go. That's great. However, if we're Faced with something, does it create an opportunity for this? Yes. Then it's like, okay, how does this now fit into what we are doing right now? And how can how can we, you know, zoom out? You know, turn the macro into or micro into a macro. How can we zoom out and really look at this and build this into into what we're offering our clients? What would you um, say to somebody who's feeling a little bit challenged on steps to take and how best to creatively connect? Um, to display who they are, you know, out and now that in this digital landscape that we're in, it's it feels so competitive to be seen, you know. And I know you help a lot of people navigate that, like you did with with the athletes and in the in the fitness arena um, that you've worked with. So I'm curious what advice you give folks when when they want to start telling their story and how best to do that in this digital space? So the I think the number one currency that we have right now is attention because it is so easy to be ignored. And there is a, there is a chasm between having a, a, a social media post or an email that you send out or a YouTube video that you post that people cannot wait to look at to consume, to download, to read through versus the email that gets put in the trash or worse yet into the spam versus the door that gets closed on your face versus the phone that gets hung up on you. And it's, is this what I want to see? Okay. So if we were to look at social media specifically, 
When I'm on Instagram, I am not holding a credit card. And when I'm on Facebook, I am not there to shop. I'm there to see things that entertain me, inspire me, or inform me. One of those three things. Okay. So Mm -hmm. when I choose to follow someone, they have to be providing me one, two, or all three of those things, information, inspiration, entertainment. And once they stray from that, once it's not informational, entertaining, or inspirational, then I lose that connection with them. I lose that trust with them. So if all you're using your social media for is a promotion of yourself and your services, it makes it truly hard for me as an audience member to even begin to connect with you. Okay. So from there, it's knowing what your channel is there for. It's there to be of service to someone else. So that's that's knowing who you are. That's knowing what you're there to do. That's knowing your messaging. That's knowing who your audience is so that you can create and you can tailor content for your audience because we are all in the publishing business now. We are all publishers. I mean, you create with your podcast. Your podcast has to hit upon what your audience needs from your show. It has to deliver that. And and yours covers all three. I'm sure yours is entertaining and we know it's inspirational. We know it's informational. And so when people subscribe to your podcast, that's what they're there for. And to put this in the, the context of when someone decides to purchase from you. Okay. So if we were to, if we were to look at this from, from, you know, expanding the timeline, I can't tell you the number of people who hire me, who say the following. I have been following your work for years. Mm. Okay. Now the four years is the important part because I don't think we, we pay attention enough to that. Four years. That means, and this is the first time I've ever talked to them. This is the first time I've ever even heard from them, but yet they followed me four years. So four years, they've looked at the content I put out, whether it's social media, podcasting, whatever it is, whatever your modes are, they followed it four years before they made the choice to contact me. For, for a project before they made the choice to hire me. So they've had to go through this entire path before they've ever decided that, yes, this is the person I want to work with. And we do ourselves a disservice when we think that, you know, I'm going to go on Instagram today, I'm going to post something and I'm going to sell X amount of my services. Right. Like, or, you know, like, like when my book came out, of course I talked about my book. Of course yeah. I'm going to talk about it. But it was one thing in a sea of providing great content and value. Right. 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 So, Myself as a photographer, if all I were to post on my social media were my work, every single day I was posting my work and only my work, I'm doing myself a disservice because I don't allow people to get to know me. Right. I don't allow people to get to understand the business behind what I'm doing, the reasons behind what I'm doing, my thought process. So if you were to go through my feed over the last year, I'm going to be incorporating like some things about my personal life right. because I want there to be a face behind the brand. So for people to get seen, once again, it's knowing who you are, what you do, who it's for, yeah. right? what they want to see, delivering them that content. Also, it's realizing that this is not a numbers game. Right. All right. I, I do not, I, I can't tell you the number of times people will tout their social media following as if it means anything at all. Right. I don't care. And right. I don't know many people who do care. And, and I laugh at all the people who spent an atrocious amount of time and or money to build a MySpace following because I'm sorry, where's it, where's it gotten you now? And right. or look at the people most recently who've invested so much into a massive Facebook page following. What is the engagement like now? Right. Okay. It's not going so well. So where can you find your, you know, as Kevin Kelly writes, your true fans, where can you find those true fans? How can you best communicate them? And how can you best invite them to be a member in this journey? And once again, going back to when people contact me, say I've been following for years, it's because I've been trying to provide value, whether it's through my blog, whether it's through podcasting, whether it's even just through my native social media posts, offering some value, some reason for them to look at it other than I need your validation of over my work. I don't care about that. But if I create something that someone looks at and it, they feel connected to me or more connected to me or more connected to the work I'm doing and it keeps them tuning in, then I've earned their attention. I feel right. like that's what we need to be doing is earning attention. Yeah, I love that because it's it's so... Um, 
hard to get uh, the right advice or even feel like the direction you're going or where you choose to invest your time because you know time is such a high high valued currency <laughs> these days as well on how to build that up and I think that advice is great it's something I challenge myself with all the time too and trying to figure out across all the different businesses I have and and you know the the impact I hope to have out in the world. Like, how do I navigate this? You know, and and how do I also make it not about like me, me, me all the time because that's not who I am. You know, but then it's like the sharing. You know, it's 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 the delicate balance between, Kareen, if it's significant to you and you want someone else to benefit from whatever it is you're going through, like this was a badass moment. Like you want to share that so it inspires others. Great. Mm-hmm. If it's if it's something that you know you have something of service that you know will be an impact, there's no way that that person will ever buy from me or want to be part of my world if they didn't have already that trust, that that connection, that that okay, this is not just she's selling me. This is she's inviting me in because she knows I'm going to benefit from it. You know, there's it's such a delicate shift in how we present ourselves. And it it can create that comparison game when you think about the number of followers. Oh my God, this person has like 20,000 followers. How did they get there? You know? And if it wasn't organic, that doesn't monetize at all. You know, and and I guarantee there was thousands of spend behind it to get there. But then what was the return? You know, so it's a, it's such an interesting landscape <laughs> we live in now. Yeah, and I have to I have to compare it. So when when I went back after after working as a commercial photographer, when I went back to intern for another photographer, this photographer has a ridiculously successful business, has no website and zero social media. Right. None. But right. yeah, I'll go to lunch with this guy. We go to lunch about every other month. We'll sit down for lunch. He will inevitably see someone he knows at the restaurant and that person will rush up, give him a hug and thank him so much for whatever the last project he worked on with them and say, we have to do this again. How often are people who give you money coming back to you say, we have to do this again? Right. That is earned respect and earned attention. And he did it without, I mean, he, you can't even find him online. I love it because it is relational when you do a financial exchange is is establishing a relationship mm-hmm. you know and i think like if we don't put that value behind that exchange of 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 monetary gain either way for return on investment and it, and it should be kind of it's almost like a coveted experience this day in this day and age when you can accomplish that offline you know, using my quotation hands, like, you know, because it's, it is the way I built my whole business. It wasn't because of online leads. It was because of relational connection and trust and showing up and, you know, cultivating that, you know, the, the goals of the strategy of that individual or that company making it happen and being asked to do it over and over and over again, which you might not see you know, in the, in the digital storytelling of, mm-hmm. of my business growth. So I love that you bring that up because it is the offline interaction is so important too. Well, and it's when we, when we look at other social media, you brought that up, we have this terrible bias because what we're looking at when we look at someone else's Instagram is we are only looking at what they want us to see what their greatest hits are. Yeah. And so if we're trying to compare ourselves to someone else's account or someone else's channel, it is so easy to be distraught. Oh, their photos are better than mine. They're getting more engagement than mine. Oh, look, they're even living a better life than I'm living. How, how dare they? And, um, <laughs> it's, but the reality is, it's like we're not posting about our failures, our shortcomings, the things that didn't work on social media. So why would they? So we have to realize that we are only looking at the greatest hits from what other people are doing. And also to add with that, just to give it a, to look at this from another, from another facet is I was listening to this interview and the, the writer on this interview was talking about what if instead of trying to grow your following as big as it could be, what if you tried to focus on what is the minimum viable number you need to run it a success successful for you. Okay. So that's why it's minimum viable because minimum would be one. You need one client is minimum, but what is the minimum viable you need? And if you, let's say it's 24, 
and you only focus on those 24, and that's all you care about is making those 24 lives better than they could ever be, right? Imagine the traction you could get with that by focusing on the minimum, the minimum number it takes to run a successful business and how that could impact your business in the future. Because those people are the people who come back again and again. And they will, that is what encourages them to tell others to do business with you. It's not putting something out, spamming the world and hoping you just get enough clicks that it that you get an ROI. Yeah, I love that analogy. That's so great. Um, from a point of view of perspective of what does it actually take, you know, to to build what it is you're trying to build, you know, and have the fulfillment that you're looking for. I think there's also a lot of depression that is occurring today from that chase of thinking, like you said, you know, all the 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 latest and greatest of someone's life. That's the only thing that's being posted, right? Mm -hmm. And then that comparison shows up, you know, as you're watching it. And then it it can cause a lot of depression in folks because then they're not going and living. They're just watching other people's lives. (laughs) And so they feel like, oh, well, I can't be that. So I'm going to be just nothing. You know, and, and, and it's an interesting environment in that way too, which is why we now have like technology detoxes and we have, <laughs> you know, get off, get off your phone, you know, like make sure you put it to bed before you go to bed. Like there's so many different ways for us to, to manage better. But I think I love the tips that you're sharing with our listeners because I think it's so important. And, and your podcast is amazing too, because you share a lot there as well through your episodes. Um, and and so we'll definitely put uh, your podcast and your site and everything in our show notes. But oh, I thank you. I think that um, you do all, you you always add a great perspective for the creative mind, um, those building creative businesses, and how to think about it. And unfortunately, in this day and age, you have to have some sort of online presence to feel credible for a sustainable legacy business, because generations younger than you and I. Are also like only no digital, right? Like, and they're only being exposed that way. And it's almost like going to be a renaissance to create like face to face interaction, connection, which is what I love about what you're doing with Fitposium. But I think it's, it's just this amazing awareness um, to bring to people's attention, like build the connection at all levels. And even if it's a simple, once a once a month something that's of value to you that you want to share with the world go ahead and put that out there you know and just be genuine about it don't overwhelm yourself about it if you truly want a content strategy go work with the experts to do it you know and figure out how best to be authentic in the strategy that you're trying to put out there if you're trying to extend your reach you know that that's the evolution of it too Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I'm, I'm glad you brought up how interactions with clients are going to change and what a younger generation is going to demand out of a client interaction or a client relationship. Because I've seen this from a few different angles where once a year, uh, some photographers and I, we get together and we get maybe three, 400 high school students together. And over the course of eight hours, we teach them everything they need to know. Should they want to get into a creative field, what they should do with their That's career. Awesome. And you'll see right away the ones who who have the drive behind it. And, and I don't necessarily judge the ones who don't because you're 17 and 18. How could you possibly know? I had no idea what my passions were at 17 or 18, or at least n- not what they could be in a business sense. Yeah. And But you see the ones who they ask questions, they're, they're interactive, and you see the ones who are willing to try things because I'll even do lighting demos and I'll, turn, I'll literally hand the gear over to them and say, let's see what you do it. And you'll see the ones who really take hold of it. And you see the ones who you see how difficult the road is going to be for them should they choose to continue down it because they just have, I mean, it's just, they're just painted in, in apathy mm-hmm. and just interest. And so I look at it and I say, I feel very bad for them when they enter the marketplace, because it's going to be a lot harder than they think it is. And, and I reflect to, you, you know, when, when we host our Fiposium conference, one of the things we do uh, that's so special is we bring out the media to be at the conference. So at this year's conference, we had the editor of Oxygen, the editor of Strong Fitness Magazine, the editor of Fitness Magazine, the editor of Golf Magazine, the editor of Women's Health and Fitness, Max Sports and Fitness. Oh, they, they're there in person. They're there in person to have face-to-face meetings with these attendees so that these attendees can shake their hands, sit across the table from one-on-one and say, 
here's who I am. And here's my story. You will not get that anywhere else in the world. I mean, you have to travel around the world to beg for these one-on-one meetings. And I remember telling that to someone and they, their response was, well, I could just DM them on Instagram. And I said, let me know how that works for you. Yeah. Like, are you going to be the person who's trying to DM them on Instagram or are you going to be the person who sits across here from them and shakes their right, hand? Right? right. Because that's, and it's a balance. I get that. It is a balance. However, even though I am, am nervous about, you know, someone who would say that about their future, I'm even more nervous about what happens when they're the person across the table and they're making the buying decisions. Because guess what? That means I need to change. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a, it's an interesting dynamic that we are living in now and um, human behavior requires connection. Yep. You know, and it, I think it's right. It's true. Like what is going to be the, the kind of purchasing, purchasing behavior of the future? Uh, and personally, I think without the true connection, they'll just be very small, trivial interactions. You know, and, and that's not enough for us to to well for most I guess it wouldn't be enough for me. I'll just speak on my own behalf. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm I like to go. I like to run deep. I like to connect, and I like to grow together. You know, and 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 it takes human interaction for that to happen, um, as well as just consistent, just like a consistency of it. You know, for me, you know, to here's- feel fulfilled. I think here's the energy behind that, which goes back to one of your earlier questions to kind of take that full circle is the individuals you are trying to reach. The individuals you're trying to reach through your social media and through your podcasts are the ones who want and expect the same thing. You are not trying to go to someone who does not want that, nor does not expect that and trying to convince them that this is what they need and this is what they want. That right there is the difference between marketing that gets the door closed in your face and, and marketing or content delivery that gets people welcoming you and saying, I've been looking for this. Thank you so much for sharing this with me. Yeah, That's the difference right there. It's not trying to convince people to do something they don't want to do. It's connecting with people who already have the want that you can deliver. I love that. And that's a, it's, a, it's such a delicate difference in that way you just stated it. But to master that, man... That would that would just exponentially grow any any business out there if you could focus on that mm-hmm. method. That's beautiful. If you think about you know where you are today and what you're trying to accomplish next, and then fast forward into like a future version of yourself. Let's say it's you know ten years from now. What do you hope that version of you would say about your curiosity and what you're going after today? It's such a beautiful question because we all make the mistake of not looking ahead far enough or not looking ahead enough with specificity. We, we have general thoughts and ideas of, oh, it would be nice if, right? And I've also been guilty of setting milestones that I will blow past and never take the second to have the perspective to realize, look what just happened. Okay. And that is something that can actually build a lot of stress in it being in being an entrepreneur, because let's just say, for example, you're brand new, you're starting off your business and your first goal is, you know what? I want to break six figures. Okay. So you set a goal. I want to break six figures, which is what I did when I launched my photography business. I left my marketing job. I said, I want to launch a six-figure photography business. And maybe, and I, I loosely said, maybe I'll do it in five years. I did it in the first year. Yeah. And then I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and I never celebrated it. Not really, because all I did was I moved the finish line. I almost didn't even allow myself to cross the finish line because there's a certain idea, you know, certain idea and mental picture of crossing the finish line and breaking through the tape. No, I kind of moved the finish line the next year. Yep. And then I challenged myself to get there and I challenged myself, but I never celebrated. So I think it's important that we have that time where we reflect back to say, look what has been achieved. Look at what we've done. And, and it, what, the metrics are entirely up to you, right? But to celebrate and to be like, we were able to do this. Okay. This was able to, to, to be done. Like, you know, when we had our fifth Osium conference this year. Uh, this was our fourth year in 2018. We said, okay, good enough would be if we had 200 people there. Perfect would be if we had 250. Well, we, we blew past perfect. And afterwards, I, had, you know, I sat down with the team and said, look at that. 
we blew past perfect. And I said, that needs to be celebrated because that, that is 200. And it was at the final number is 267, 267 people whose lives were able to change. That's important. Okay. And we need to celebrate that. We need to realize the importance of that. So to get back to your question, when I expand the timeline long enough, it is, it is a life that I've created for myself and for my family where I'm able to celebrate being an entrepreneur while being able to work as a freelancer when I choose to work as a freelancer. And, and the reason I say that entrepreneur versus freelancer is because there's a difference. When I'm a photographer, I'm a freelancer. The only time I'm making money is if I'm out taking photos. Okay. And if, if I'm sick or if I can't make it or if, you know, whatever, I will not make that money. Okay. So my entire work as a freelancer, I can only increase revenue doing one of two things. One is get more clients. The problem with getting more clients is you'll run up against time. You can only be only so much time to take on new clients and two is to get better clients. All right. And that's a lifelong goal is getting better clients. And eventually you try to get the best clients, right? Now, being an entrepreneur is being a business owner where I'm making money or I'm bringing in a return without me being tied to every single specific project that is being done. So, you know, we, we kind of alluded to, I mean, there's the Fiposium conference. Uh, I also manage a graphic designer and a web designer through a creative company. And uh, I manage a studio that will rent out a photo, uh, I should say, mixed media studio. And so we have these different facets where money can come in. And the, the goal within, let's just say, 10 years is that those are the flagship. That is what's driving my income. Where when I look at my photography business, no longer do I take projects that I take because I have to pay the mortgage. And I've already started to see that turn now where I can say no to projects without worry of, well, what happens when that next bill comes in? Well, guess what? I have these other businesses that can cover that. And now when it comes to my work, the thing that is most personal to me, which is when I create art, it is now the most important thing that I put my vision, my perspective in. So I'm not taking photos. I am now making photos. So that is what I want to see. And so my encouragement to myself from 10 years is continue to focus on what that looks like and continue to work in that direction so you can build the work that you are most proud of. That's beautiful. I, I, I love that as a perspective of your future self to now because it'll help guide you as that North Star You know, mm -hmm. for every activity you take now. Just like you have mission statements and boundaries for your business, it is so important as a, a leader of your business and a, and a leader of your own life to do the same so that you are constantly doing your best to um, to stand in your purpose you know so so that that future version of yourself has a lot of damn pride <laughs> for, I, for accomplishing that which is so I think one of the things that helped me is to understand and articulate the reason why why do I do this because I see so many people even successful entrepreneurs who are doing such beautiful, important work who can't actually answer why they're doing it. Right. Okay. And so, I mean, for me, it was when I look back and I, you know, I mentioned that college professor who, who did not see a future for me other than to do what I'm doing right now. Well, he pulled me out of a struggle that I was going through, a creative struggle, a personal struggle, a mental struggle, a struggle of maturity. And he showed me how success could be attained through work. Okay. And through effort. And when I look at what we're doing in creating art and opportunity, it's paying that forward. It's that same thing. That's the reason why. It's because someone gave me an opportunity to succeed or fail, okay? And I want to push that opportunity onto other, pe the other people who are willing to try to succeed or fail. Yeah. Show the, show the path. Show the method. Show it's possible. Give some permissioning. Yes. That's phenomenal. Well, James, this has been such an amazing conversation. And I just want to pause and thank you for dropping all these nuggets and sharing it with our listeners and, and um, giving us a piece of yourself today. <laughs> it's, been, it's been an honor to have this exchange. I would, I would love for you to share with our listeners the best way to connect with you. Absolutely. And, and, and Karina, I want to thank you because 
doing a podcast like you do and connecting with the audience that you connect with, it does exactly what you said. It gives people the permission to do something on their own. And the reality is, is we don't need that permission. We just think we need that permission. So the fact that your podcast can be a key for so many people to be like, you know what? Yes, I can do this. I can achieve this. So my hat's off to you for for putting together the show and for putting together a community that listens to it because that is the change that people need to start enacting in their lives. So thank you for that. Thank you for being a part of it. Absolutely. So um, my my I have two main websites. My website is jamespatrick.com. That's where I share my photo work. That's where my blog is. I host a podcast, which is on iTunes, Apple Podcast app, but also on my website, jamespatrick.com, called Beyond the Image. That podcast is for creatives. It's for photographers, illustrators, artists to understand career development in that industry. And then fitposium.com is my conference. We have an annual conference every year in October in Arizona. But we also have our weekly Fitposium podcast, which is about developing a career as a health and fitness and wellness entrepreneur. So lots of lots of content and resources I'm pumping out on a weekly basis. My team and I, I should say. That's beautiful. And and I know people will be reaching out because you you've you've already, I'm sure, sparked so much thought. And they're going to want to know more about the, the how, you know. Oh, so, you. so I'm sure they'll reach out. the um, The way I like to close out an episode is for my guest to define what. How do you define a badass? So, I and and I love that you asked that question. You know, before we were going into this interview, I filled out that form, and I had typed the most beautiful, eloquent response, and I was so proud of myself for that. However, I am plagued with a bad memory. So of course, I don't remember what I wrote. But let me tell you what the the essence of being a badass means to me at this moment in time is, and I'm going to kind to kind of continue off of what we were just talking about. The badass is the person who does not wait for permission to do the work that they want to do does not make excuses, is willing to be held accountable. I can't tell you the number of people. You know, we, we just we hired a photographer to photograph our symposium conference, and they ended up hiring me to help consult them to grow their photo business. And you know, we were having this conversation. I said, so tell me a little about what you who you are, what you want to do. And they said, Well, you know, I'm trying to, you know, be a photographer. I said, stop right there. That is not owning what you do. The number of people who say it would be nice to, it would be great if, I would love a future when, own what you do, be held accountable for what you do. Don't be afraid to say, this is who I am. This is what I do. This is what I want to be held accountable for. To me, anytime I talk to someone who doesn't just share an idea with me, who shares, here's what I'm doing right now. This yeah. is actually happening to me. That is a badass. And that person always, always gets my respect. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that definition. And I really appreciate you sharing that because it is important to realize the only permissioning does come from yourself mm-hmm. to step into who you're meant to be. And sometimes it's just a story in our heads that we have to unlearn to take that first badass step forward to what it is and who it is we want to be. Absolutely. So thank you so much again for joining me today, James. It's been amazing speaking with you. And of course, I know it's one of many more conversations to come. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Karine. 